Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Um, Todd McFarland called me a couple of weeks ago, about two weeks ago, and said that there was a lot of interest in the sage grouse issue, and particularly with uh, effects of predator uh, impacts on sage grouse. And, uh, and so I could talk about that, but I've got to tell you folks that I've been involved in this for quite some time. And one of my objectives over the years was to gather as much scientific and historical information as I possibly could to discredit all that the agency was saying with regards to many of these issues, including the sage grouse issue. And of course, I have, like a lot of you, been very, very unsuccessful. And of course, like most of you over the years, I've gone to all these public input hearings, presented my data, even gone back and tried to improve on what I had and work with others, and I'd go back again and I'd have public input, but nothing would be resolved. We'd have the same thing. Well, after doing this for 20, 25 years, I became aware that there was uh, also an individual within the uh, sheep growers community who was also concerned. And he, he determined that the next time that he was to go before one of these agencies, he was going to have the best possible data. He was going to record what was happening and then be able to take it to court and show that the agencies paid no, uh, no respect whatsoever for that data. And so fortunately when he did that, and then he was going back for that second stage, he was able to get the National Cattle Beef Association and the Wool Growers Association and the grass raisers of back in the Midwest, Midwest and the Farm Bureau behind him. He went to 10th Circuit Court, and 10th Circuit Court ruled, citing a Supreme Court decision, and said that under NEPA, the federal agencies are not obligated to base their decisions on base best information presented. They're only obligated to hold the hearings, the public comment hearings, and look at it. But the decisions are not based upon the very best scientific and commercial data. Well, that reminded me of my involvement a number of years earlier when the desert tortoise issue arose in the early 1990s in southern Nevada and what plummeted and what the Bundys have been involved with in recent years. Well, because I was also at that time uh, acquainted with Karen Budd from Big Piney, Wyoming, a young attorney who had just recently served under Ed Meese, and uh, she determined that she was going to try to help during her career the range livestock industry, she came to me and she said, the cowboys in southern Nevada have hired me on the desert tortoise issue, and we're going to go before the Interboard of Land Appeals. And because of your research, I want you to go back and do additional research into the history of desert tortoise in that region. And so I did that. I was already seeing a lot of data back at that time with regards to effects of ravens on desert tortoise and coyotes, but mostly ravens. So it gave me an opportunity to go down there. And I did three things. When I got down there, first I collected all of the earliest logs and diaries of all the earliest explorers. And I recorded that, and all the testimony about how the Indians lived. And it was indicated that there was no tortoise in that region. Very rarely was there ever tortoise ever seen in that region, historically. In fact, as the explorers came out through that country, they already knew what they'd be facing, and most of them would take a flock of sheep, and sometimes cattle. And even then, before they'd get to California, they would quite after, often have to start eating their horses. So the history was showing that there were no desert tortoise of any degree in that entire region, in Arizona, Southern California, and Southern Nevada, historically. During this process, I was able to get acquainted with a guy named Vern Bostick. Vern Bostick had grown up in Colorado and wanted to become a researcher, and followed his dream and ended up working up until he was in a higher position in the Silver City 
uh, research station, forest research station in New Mexico. And a study came up, a study was proposed to determine the effects or the ill effects of mule deer or livestock grazing on mule deer on the Arizona Strip. And he was in a position to go up there and he spent about four years. He had a, quite a number of people working under him. They did a series of studies to determine those effects. And when he got all done, he found no little effects. In fact, they found that there was benefits of those animals being on that strip, that they were refreshing all of the vegetation, including browse, as well as grass and forest. And unfortunately, at that time, Vernon then had a heart attack. He was having a lot of pressure put on him, not only by the Forest Service, but also from the Arizona Game and Fish Department to skew the study the way they wanted it done. And so out of all of that, out of a period when he was away for sick leave, they brought in an individual from Ogden, head of the region, and that individual rewrote the report and changed it completely. As a result of that, he left. But he lived in Las Vegas following that time, and Vernus had been concerned as I, and he'd gone back and he found all the scientific studies with regards to effects of cattle on rangelands and thus on desert tortoise. And he had five conclusive studies that all showed clearly, they all showed clearly that wherever livestock were reduced, there was a co corresponding downcline in desert tortoise numbers. So anyway, I put this together, the science, the history, and then I also went around and reviewed uh, many of the old timers that trapped in that area, people that uh, had cowboyed in that area. Most of them are deceased now. But they all testified that, yes, when they were in the cow business or cowboying in that entire region in the 1940s and 50s, there was an abundance of tortoises. And in fact, they witnessed this tortoise eating cow pies and how they witnessed also the fact that when new grass comes and it's interrupted with cows eating it off, then it refreshes. Like Hank Boger was just telling me a minute ago. Being a sheep man, he understands that grass, after it gets so large, the sheep don't like it anymore. Well, that's the same way as sage grouse, same way as desert tortoise. That's the benefit that Plus, the cows were watering a long ways away, chewing up that grass and dropping those cow pies two, three miles away from water. And then those animals, the desert tortoise, would come along and they not only get the fresh green vegetation ground up, but also the uh, water was a big, great benefit to them. But all that science wasn't new. We learned, we knew from all the reports that I was reading, all of the people involved in the environmental movement, all of the people in the fish and game department and all of the people in the Fish and Wildlife Service knew these things, but they had an agenda. And so, yes, when we went to court down there, we thought we had all of the data, all of the best science. We were gonna go in there and we thought in that before the Interboard of Land Appeals, we were gonna win that case. Well, it was towards the end, after all the information had been presented, it was towards the end that Larry Silver, the counsel for the government, got up and approached the bench, an old elderly gentleman who quite obviously was wanting to decide what was good for desert tortoise out there. He approached the bench and he said, Your Honor, I must remind you that this will be on appeal. And when it's on appeal, The only decision that's going to be decided is whether those cowboys out there follow the direction of the resource management plan. Because it's not you, and really he didn't say it, but it's not your local community that makes the decision on whether livestock grazing is detrimental to that species or not out there. That's the biological opinion. When Congress wrote that, they gave the Fish and Wildlife Service, the authority to make the biological opinion. And so what I'm trying to convey to you people here today, in my long study of trying to find a solution to the situation, I've come to understand that one of our greatest violations, 
one of our greatest violations that's the heart of what we're facing here today is you and I folks don't have the right of due process. With that, I want to I want to talk to you people a little bit about, so what is due process then? Well, if you read the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which we're all familiar with, and I won't read it all, all of the Fifth Amendment, but essentially what it says is in this regard, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then following that it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And I believe that's a big part of our problem. Our generation believes that due process only involves the right of something that's defined as property and that we have just compensation. But this is not what the founders had in mind. When I started becoming aware of this and tried to learn more, I went back and I started reading the case law with regards to the Fifth Amendment. And I found that there was a doctrine early in the history of the creation of America called the doctrine of reasonableness. And what all these Supreme Court decisions said, that no, due process is not about necessarily getting your just compensation for your property. What it's about is before the government can take anything away from you, any of your rights away from you, they are burdened. The burden is upon them to prove that what they are going to do is going to result in a public good. In other words, that if they're going to protect the sage, sage grouse out there, the burden is upon them to prove that their actions are in fact Otherwise, they have no right to infringe on your rights. So let me read this over, you, over to you again. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property. Well, think about that, life and liberty. You know, being in the public lands issues all these years and being a cattleman, I've always thought about my grazing rights. I want it defined as a right. We started the National Federal Lands Conference, DeMar and I and others, years ago. Our primary goal was to get a recognition for those grazing rights. We were frustrated. Why wasn't there recognition? But I was confused, and now I know better. I know that as a family, myself and I have gone up the canyons behind the ranch for years to pick cher choke cherries, or to picnic, or to hunt deer. And that's part of my liberty. And so due process, in the founder's mind, apply just as much to that liberty as does to somebody's property. You have a liberty, a right to not be infringed. If you look it up in the dictionary, you wonder what liberty, it's not to be infringed on by any other person or party. Only if there's to be a public good come out of that. That's what we've got to remember. This is what we've got to remember or understand with regards to what's happening in the United States today. Is that that person that's been going up there and hunting rocks up on the Ruby Mountains for their entire life. The burden should be upon them. And this is what we've lost. This is what we've lost. We do not have due process rights. Think about it. Think about it. I made a list of rights. I went back and I looked at all the court cases and I made a list of rights. And these are listed under common law. What is common law? Well, I made a study of common law. What common law is, it's those court cases that were laid down historically, even before we came to the United States. English common law dates back to the signing, first signing of the Magna Carta, when they first started understanding these things. And so our due process rights under the Constitution are, I'm going to read them to you, and they're not just to go to a meeting have, have, have public input. They're for, number one, the eight principles. The right to be noticed of all pending government actions. The right that formal hearings be held. The right to present evidence, cross-examination, and call witnesses. That those present who present testimony or evidence be sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The right to be heard by an impartial board, tribunal, or arbitrator. 
that all testimony, evidence be made part of the record, that final judgment be rendered based upon facts presented, that no governmental action be implemented if found to be arbitrary, capricious, or contrary to stated objectives. So this, folks, is, is, is the clutch of where I am today, what I'm understanding. Because more and more, you know, we, we've all heard very great speakers here today. And they're all talking about their rights. And maybe this is where I've had a hang up. Because a number of years ago, I started reading all the Supreme Court decisions that have been rendered historically with regards to public lands issues. And the thing that struck me most was the court, the Supreme Court, in 28 instances has said that when the federal government acts pursuant to the public lands out here, we'll debate about the language, what kind of lands they are, but when they manage out here in the public lands or these lands they have authority for, they operate under Article 4. And those same court decisions are said again and again and again that when they operate by that authority, that authority is plenary and without limitation. Now think about that term, without limitation. Because everything what America was about, the whole concept of America, was to protect individual rights against the majority or the, or the king or the sovereign or whoever was the government. The founders of this country saw that more clearly than anything else. Those rights that were enumerated in the Bill of Rights, those were to be protected. And they were going to limit the power of government, not only on the federal level, but the state level. Limited government. So when they talk, when the Supreme Court talks about you're out here on these public lands and their power is without limitation. So you wonder why the Bundys are down up in Oregon or down in southern Nevada and they're not being treat it as what we might think that they are. They're already considered guilty before they even go to court. They're not treated as innocent until proven guilty. What about the Hammonds up there when they were prosecuted under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1996? And we wondered why they weren't afforded the rights under the Eighth Amendment. But didn't the Supreme Court tell us what the problem is? And didn't the Supreme Court also identify all other rights that we have, including how you're prosecuted if you're stopped on the roads. So another big in, interesting information, bit of information I came across a few years back, thanks to a person in Colorado. He had found where Congress in the early 1970s had been approached by many, many of the constituents across the country, and they wanted to stop them the federal government from exercising war powers in the United States. And so in order to determine if it was true that war powers were being exercised, Congress itself commissioned a study. And a group of attorneys went back and studied and explained at the time in 1933 that really what Roosevelt did when they came forward, what Roosevelt did when he came forward and initiated action whereby all of a sudden, the ranchers and farmers could get subsidies, and that had always been ruled unconstitutional prior to that time. And why they were able to give so much strength to the Federal Reserve System is because they did it under war powers. And then that same congressional report, this is not Cliff Gardner. This is the congressional report that you can bring up on your, on your internet at any time. And he explains that after Roosevelt was out of office, then Nixon used it instead of declaring war for the police action in Korea. He just implemented it under war powers. And even Eisenhower, when he got out and became president, he wanted a highway system for, for the defense of the country, clear across the nation. And unfortunately for him, the Supreme Court already ruled many times that the federal government had no authority over roads. And so he did that under war powers. So now today you get stopped on these roads out here that are federal highways, and you wonder why, possibly, that you're not afforded your rights when they stop you. 
but nobody has ever asked the question. Nobody's ever asked the question of what authority is the federal government operating under? And in that regard, it was interesting to me when I found a Supreme Court decision called Hoover, Hoover and Ellison v. Evett. And in that case, these kind of questions came forward, and what the Supreme Court explained was that the federal government, when they're operating under the name United States, they can operate as a sovereign over the people, they can operate as a sovereign over the territory, they can act as a sovereign, as a nation between nations. And the rules that they go by are all different. So folks, what I'm trying to tell you, one of our biggest problems in the United States today, when we go to court, we don't know if they're operating under Article Four powers. We don't know if they're operating under war powers or emergency powers. We don't know how they're operating, and we don't even know if there's a mix of that. So I thought a lot about that. One of the solutions in the, in the future is if we had enough understanding without our, within our society where we could uniformly go to our representatives and say, hey, we want Congress to pass a law and dictate that every law that's been passed has to indicate on what authority the federal government. Then when you went into court, you'd know what your rights were. But as it is today, what I try to tell people, under that federal jurisdiction, there's no reason in the world that you should think that you're going to get a fair trial or that you're going to win in any way, shape, or form. I don't know how you could do that. So I've taken quite a bit of your time. But more recently, what I've done is I've gone back into, fortunately for me, there was a group of individuals here not too many years ago, back, not too many years ago, that, that went back and looked at the, the uh, constitutional records, primarily, but in the Elliott Papers and uh, the Farron Papers and all of those, and they came out with a better document, and now you can go into that. It's actually five documents. I'm just bringing one to the table today. But there's five of those. You can go in there, and if you look up the Fifth Amendment, you can go back and read every founder's discussion and the constitutional debates and all of those records dating clear back to John Locke and Joseph Smith and all of those earliest minds that really brought forth our concept of American freedom in America. And you know what I'm learning? I'm learning so doggone much. I've got a lot more study to do. But you know what I'm learning? The more I study, the more I understand that the whole problem is that we've been deprived of local self-government. You know, they talked about the right of peers, and they defined, and founders talked about what the peers were. They were to be the neighbors. They were to be the people that understood the customs and cultures within local community. As an example with Hage, right after Hage, Wayne Hage filed his suit, it wasn't long after that, the government wanting to uh, harass the family. They brought a case against them for removing vegetation from White Sage Ditch, an irrigation they ditch they had. And it went down to, the question went to uh, Federal District Court in Las Vegas. Well, they gave the Hages, they gave the Hages the option of having a, a jury decide the case. And they chose 12 persons, 12 women. And the person, the counsel for the government came forward, and all he talked about was that Hage and Seaman had cut a tree 145 years old on that ditch right away, and wasn't that a shame? Well, that's one of the reasons I came to understand. I came to understand why you have to be before the local community. Because 12 women from Las Vegas have no idea what ditch right-of-ways are for. If you take that ditch right-of-way, you can't irrigate. There goes your cow outfit. So those founders protected ditch right-of-ways for a reason. And the state and the local government. But that's just an example. Think about the Bundy family. Think about the Bundy family, the Bundy family down in southern Nevada. If they had been tried in Mesquite or Bunkerfield by their neighbors, by their peers, and the jury had been selected from that area, would those people have been, uh, would they have been convicted of a crime? 
Cliff, you no, of course they would. Cliff, you got a wrap? Okay, am I out of time? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cliff Gardner. <laughs> we'll come back for questions. The next attorney in the house. You know I had to say that, right, Joe? Yeah, I thought you were going to call me a carpetbagger. I could call you a carpetbagger. I'm good with that. Our next carpetbagger, ambulance chaser from D.C. We'll find out if he's a bureaucrat in a moment. Joe Wilson with the Animal Law Group. He's going to talk about endangered species. And I have a pretty good han hankering. He's going to mention the sage grouse or the sage chicken, Ramona. But I do want to remind you, Joe, and you might remind the folks, there's 1,430 animals currently listed under protection and endangered in critical habitat or endangered species and 901 plants. So it's not like they don't have a plethora to choose from. <laughs> folks, Joe Wilson. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to fumble here while I actually, they gave me this tool to flip through slides and hopefully it actually will work. I feel compelled to. Uh, <laughs> There we go. Again, I can't thank you all enough. Um, the invitation from Protect the Harvest, Dave Duquette, to speak to you all today. Uh, and thank you in advance for listening to me. I'm going to try to streamline, in the interest of time, and the instructions are Trent, what I was going to talk about. And he also said you all are pretty savvy when it comes to, hey, what's the listing process under the Endangered Species Act and how it goes. But by all means, if you have any questions on that, if I'm taking liberties with that that I shouldn't, um, let me know and I'll stop. What I am going to try to focus more on are risks that the Endangered Species Act is going to be expanded in the near term and how that will affect even more your ability to use land that you own as well as land that the federal government owns, such as through your grazing permits and as important, potential solutions to address that, okay? Um, in terms of if I was asked Dave to pass out, it's a one sheet I gave set, so each of your tables should have it. If for some reason you were to nod off and fall asleep, you're gonna see Wilson's seven points. That is, in a nutshell, the high level sum and substance of all my points and all my messages that I hope you take away. Everything else is gonna, that I talk about is gonna try to put a, a, a sharper point on that. Um, so, what is it? You guys like, what gives this guy from DC, you know, why should I listen to him? And what I'm gonna tell you is, briefly, is not to brag, to make you feel comfortable why you should. Um, I'm a member of the animal law group at my law firm, Kelly Dry and Warren in DC, and we deal with Endangered Species Act matters in a boatload of other legal issues that affect persons and businesses' rights to use animals in their work. Um, we've been, you know, dozens of years of collective experience in that. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Wild Earth Guardians before. Um, we, over the past couple years, in one case, beat them three times. On behalf of our client, the state of New Mexico, Wild Earth brought a, a, a case against them saying, hey, you violated the Endangered, Endangered Species Act by issuing trapping licenses and experimental wolf population released under the Endangered Species Act got caught in it. We beat them back with a statutory exception there and that also that they didn't have standing. Went up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals here where we won again on appeal. And this is where we're particularly proud and it addresses some of the issues, how do we fund litigation. Came back down, we won attorney's fees on behalf of the state of New Mexico. Normally you see it, thank you. Um, yeah, normally you see that going the other way. We want it on behalf of a defendant and the people um, doing that. My colleague, Wayne D'Angelo, who I spent an inordinate amount of time, he's probably sick of hearing me preparing this presentation. He represents 
uh, oil industry, for better or for worse. I realize some of you may have problems with that. But he's fighting the Endangered Species Act and representing them all the time, local courts, for FWS, and in Court of Appeals on listings. And he's been instrumental uh, in some victories here in Utah with, you may be aware of the beard tongue. Uh, it's a little plant that uh, was threatened to be listed. And then also for those of you who ever drive through Texas and New Mexico, the, the desert sagebrush lizard, he worked and was able to keep those species from being listed. Okay. Um, and then finally, a solution some of you all should keep in mind. There's the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act out there. So if you're ever getting harassed by the environmental uh, non-government organizations or animal rights groups, which I'll collect and call ENGOs, and Trent duly noted that they're not environmental groups at all. Uh, that can protect you. That's a federal criminal statute that you, you know, if you're ever actually being harassed, you may want to contact your federal prosecutor and go after that. My firm was instrumental in helping that get adopted by Congress. So again, I don't say any of that to brag, but just so you know, who you're talking, you know, who's talking to you here. Um, look, I'm, like I said, I'm going to zip through the background on the Endangered Species Act. The purpose, not other purposes, the purpose of the Endangered Species Act is to conserve species at risk of extinction. I'm taking some liberties there with the language. It's not other purposes, that is it, okay? And I'm gonna stop. Stated like that and at that level, that's a pretty laudable goal, okay? If you were to say otherwise, you know, that's kinda like saying apple pie and motherhood aren't good things. Crowd. Normally that one gets a laugh or two. But uh, where we get lost is in the implementation of that, in particular at the administrative level and by your listing agencies, particularly for y'all here who are dealing in land use industries, uh, Federal Fish and Wildlife Service, and in some of the uh, environmental NGOs who use that to pursue a vastly different agenda than uh, conservation of species. It has been, by the way, the ESA, right, you probably recognize, has been referred to as the pit bull of environmental statutes. It is very strict when it applies, and its application can be expansive. Um, for instance, there's a lawsuit going on, it's been going on for years out in Oregon, which when I was doing research on this, I found amazing. I never thought, like, how the hell does the Endangered Species Act get here? Deals with the issuance of flood insurance by FEMA. They got sued by an environmental group because of their floodplain maps that go with the federal flood insurance that's underwritten by FEMA. I'm like, my God, how, how does the Endangered Species Act touch that? But it's broad in its application. The environmental NGOs like it, and I have some slides up here, <laughs> there. They use it to pursue, again, agendas that have nothing to do with conservation. One of the quotes here is, they're trying to do it to use it to deal with um, issuance of toxic chemicals, okay? Not really anything to do with conservation of species. And then the big kicker, and you all are probably aware of this, the whole northern spotted owl, fight about 15 years ago, that wasn't about saving the northern spotted owl. That was about certain environmental groups not wanting to cut down trees and, you know, suppressing logging. Okay. So, and that's where some of these, you have people out there who are using this statute in a way that is off the pinnings of its purpose. And when that's done, that can be not only lead to detrimental results for people who use the land, but for actually the species that need to be conserved. Uh, you know, because I, I don't know about you, I mean, I might get pissed off if I have to pay taxes or something like that, but at least if I know my taxes are being managed well and going to like good things, like, you know, taking care of old sick people and stuff like that, 
I'm like, okay, I got to pay my fair share. You know, and maybe it's a little bit easier to stomach if, okay, I've got, let's pretend the jackalope has been listed as an endangered species and that somehow restricts your ability to use your rangeland. I mean, if it is actually helping to foster the conservation and the recovery of the jackalope, at least that's a bit easier to stomach, okay? Right, briefly, again, the Endangered Species Act applies to species that are listed as endangered or threatened, and I'm gonna lump them all together and just refer to them as endangered. It can affect your ability to use land that you very much own yourself. Okay, so let's, again, let's stick with my hypothetical, the jackalope, right? We all know the jackalope, the mythical animal of the West, um, has been listed as endangered species, and it's on your land. Okay, you can't kill it straight away. That one's pretty clear. Okay, but how the statute affects, right, your ability to use the land is the Endangered Species Act also prevents you taking actions that harm it. And harm has been defined in such a way as if it leads to the alteration or modification of habitat, even if it appears on your land, that results in the death of the animal, that is considered a take. So we are looking at a broad and pervasive federal land use regulation. Um, how it affects, right, the lands that you may lease from the federal government for range rights and your ability to use that. Every federal agency um, that supports a program or administers something under federal law has to take steps to conserve endangered species and the critical habitat that's been designated. And so no doubt a lot of you have probably already experienced you know, applications for grazing permits that have been affected by an Endangered Species Act analysis. Um, and if you haven't, you're one of the lucky ones. Um, keep in mind, and as Trent pointed out at the beginning, there is already a, and this is a legal term, the boatload, a boatload of species that have been listed as endangered. Up there, which you can't read because it's too small, um, is a listing just of species right here in Utah that have been listed, okay? Um, critical habitat, same thing. There is a boatload of species, or a critical habitat that has been designated. And again, that affects primarily your ability to use federal land, but the more federal land that has been designated as critical habitat, the harder and harder it is gonna be for industries who need to use that federal land to use it. For instance, some examples, you know, the polar bear recently was upheld in court, critical habitat designation of 120 million acres, okay? Our friend the northern spotted owl had up in the Pacific Northwest 9.57 million acres of critical habitat designated. Mexican spotted owl recently, 8.1 million acres of critical habitat designated, All right? Do you see a theme here? Lots of land being affected, lots of species, equals restraints on your ability to use the land. Going back to the amount of land that's been designated as critical habitat, just to put some things in perspective, you got the total acreage of states. Again, California is 101 million acres, acres give or take a few square feet. Uh, Oregon, 62 million. Utah, 54.3. I got it all listed there. I put in Massachusetts, just so we can have a smaller comparator. Um, and I had the math written down here. I gotta I got do it because it's kind of interesting. If you take the screenshot from my uh, iPhone calculator app and think of it as the uh, total area of a state, um, the amount that, for instance, the northern spotted owl was listed, I think, came up to be about 20% of the total land area of the state of Oregon. Now, mind you, it all wasn't listed in Oregon. I'm just giving you that as a comparator. That would make up two of these squares, 
That's a lot of land, okay? Mexican spotted owl, that's like 15%, if I'm right, of uh, the state of Utah. Again, I don't think it was listed in the state of Utah, but 15% is a lot in terms of restricting your ability. Let's go on and there's actually, when a species is listed, is endangered, right, under the Endangered Species Act, there can be some real and detrimental effects to you and to the species itself. I think you all have harped on this already. It will limit your ability to use your own land, potentially, and also federal land. But also, listing a species is no panacea and can actually impede the conservation of the species if it is listed, okay? Listing a species is saying, woo, it's endangered. If you don't do more, that's hollow, and that happens all the time. Environmental groups put in massive petitions, let's get a boatload of species listed. But if you don't have funding from the feds to take actions to recover the species or develop re meaningful recovery plans, that thing's not gonna recover, and the people who bear the burden are you with no corresponding benefit to the species. Furthermore, and perhaps even more important, listing a species can impede conserving it. When the red cockaded woodpecker was up for listing and people expected it to be listed, right, and this is a bird that lives in old growth forests and trees. It happened primarily out in the southeast, I believe. People whose land were gonna be affected were like, well, hell, I don't want this bird living on my land. I mean, that's gonna be the death knell for me to be able to timber and log on my forest. They went around cutting out the old growth trees so the bird wouldn't show up, thereby actually killing the habitat ahead of the game. That's perverse and, again, antithetical to the actual object of conserving species. Okay, then we also get listing a species. Well, and my, my colleague, I mentioned Wayne D'Angelo, tells me about this one. Listing one species can divert resources from the conservation of species who need it much more. And he always used like, hey, the environmental groups trumpeted and busted their butt to get the polar bear listed. In terms of species that are at or near the brink of, you know, dying, the polar bear is low on the list. There are species that are much closer, and there's reasons why the polar bear was picked. The term is charismatic megafauna. Everyone knows what the polar bear, they can identify it. It's much easier than the tiger salamander, a slimy little thing, you know, kids identify with the polar bear. That's why it got listed, but if you look in the, you know, the threats, the polar bear's doing okay. Here's the kicker, and, and I want to uh, drive home. You all are facing a real and substantial risk that the reach of the Endangered Species Act and how it affects your ability to use land is going to expand significantly in the near term without any corresponding increase in the conservation of species. As a matter of fact, it could even increase the detriment to the goal of conserving species. How is this gonna come about? If you didn't ask it, I'm gonna ask it for you. How, how is this gonna happen, Joe? Joe, can, can you tell us how to prevent it? Uh, gotta tell you what the problem is first, because that leads to what the solution is. Uh, we're pretty good on the problem, I think. Well, are you aware, like, the mega listings that's gone on, is everyone here, right? You had the people who petitioned Congress and slapped, you know, one case, hey, I want you to list 200 species at one time, forced Fish and Wildlife Services and the other services to settle with them. They had to pay out a massive amount in attorney's fees. And the environmental groups were able to dictate the scope of how those species were listed, right? 
problem two is to that happening. FWS and others are relying on global warming all over the place to justify listing species in critical habitat. And even if you were to, as I sweat up here, uh, accept the notion that global warming is occurring on a global level, it's a far reach to say that it's happening in any particular range of a species. And then even another reach that the species would be negatively impacted by that or won't alter its behavior. Uh, I believe there's something going up on in Michigan in that effect that, oh my God, we have to list the wolverine because global warming is going to reduce the amount of time snows on the ground in Michigan. The wolverine burrows in the snow. That's where they live. Well, maybe if there's no snow, you know, the wolverine will figure out to burrow in the ground or something like that. Okay, we just don't know. I mean, if snow's on the ground, that, you know, what alternative does it have? The environmental groups have used their massive listing petitioning campaign before to great excess, success, pardon me. Right now they're curtailed by the settlement agreement from bringing listing campaigns, at least to that extent, for about another year or so. We fully expect them to bring another massive listing campaign on the agencies and that the agencies will have to, for lack of a better term, knuckle under and settle out and let the environmental groups steer a lot of the dialogue and how species are listed, okay? More species that are listed, more critical habitat listed, again, affects you, affects the species detrimentally. Here we go, Trent, to answer your question, I'm wrapping it up here. How can you affect this? Voluntary conservation efforts that you probably are already taking yourselves. That's good. It can be good for an animal that's threatened. You probably know better than people sitting at fish and wildlife because you walk the land all the time. Furthermore, efforts that you are taking voluntarily can actually come into the discussion when, among other things, a critical habitat designation is at issue. Another potential solution and this one's a bit of a more of a mixed bag. You may want to promote your local, your state and local governments to enter into conservation agreements. Um, I say mixed bag because there was a lot of displeasure with the uh, sage grouse conservation agreements. But there are some positive examples where it happened, particularly with the beard tongues in Utah. Um, that alleviated a lot of what have been a lot of regulatory burden on land users. Another solution, continue efforts to seek to amend the Endangered Species Act. But um, I wouldn't hold my breath, and I'll be frank with you, on that succeeding. Last major uh, amendments to any federal environmental statute occurred back in the 90s. Congressman Richard Pombo, I don't know if any of you are aware of him, back in California, um, Yosemite fell within his district. This was in the early 2000s. He tried to amend the Endangered Species Act. He had a target effectively put on his back by various environmental groups. Um, and lost funding was under constant assailment from them. He was not reelected. Um, and that message probably got out like, you know, walk on eggshells if you want to get reelected. But here is something that. I don't know if other people are thinking about doing this. In Trent, this kind of actually goes to a point that one of the first questions you asked this morning. How can we use what the environmental groups are doing and litigate against them? We would recommend taking Wild Earth Guardians and the Center for Biological Diversity's own strategy of seeking massive petitions for listing a boatload of species Turn that around, do a massive delisting campaign all at the one time. You're going to require FWS, you know, use their playbook against them. You're going to dictate the agenda. And you're going to get, I think, or at least you're going to stand in the conversation, to get species listed that should no longer be listed. That will free up 
in turn, some ability for you to use your land and federal land, and hopefully in turn, focus efforts on conserving other species that are more at risk. Two other points. My triple E here, educate, evangelize, and engage. Please, please stay on top. There's plenty of postings that the Fish and Wildlife Service will send out about species that are gonna be listing. You need to comment. You all who are using the land have some of the best data. You are the, some of the people who are impacted the most by anything. Evangelize, and I think Serena mentioned this was a key uh, plank in her discussion. Let people know about the good things that you do. Not only in, for instance, ranchers feeding the population of this country and others, but also, hey, we're stewards of the land and we try to do the right thing and even take care of critters that, you know, may be difficult for us and there may not be a big economic incentive there to do, but we try to do the right thing. Get your message out. Another one, engage. And this kind of deals, dovetails with my last point, right? The uh, hang together, the great Benjamin Franklin quotation. If we do not all hang together, we will surely hang separately. Seek allies and talk with people in other industries who may be facing the same types of issues. In some of these industries, you might think at first blush are seemingly very disparate. But for instance, some of my clients are been dog breeders or folks who use animals in the entertainment industry or actually who run zoos. You guys face some of the same Endangered Species Act. You join with them on common issues. You can get a lot done. In engaging and hanging together, last point here, join groups like Protect the Harvest and participate actively in them on what they do to promote and defend your rights. Other group, my colleague has formed it, we're starting to get members, it's the Coalition for Conservation Reform. We are focused solely on the Endangered Species Act reform, principally through its implementation and how it's gotten off its hinges and is being abused and the thought of the delisting campaign. If any of you all are interested in that, please, please let me know. Before you sit down. I'm not sitting down. You owe me seven times, say the word pseudo, because you used environmentalist without pseudo seven times. I want you to correct yourself. Pseudo, 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 pseudo. Okay, I'm gonna do this in, in lawyerly fashion for the lawyers here. I'm gonna footnote it once, pseudo, and then I'm gonna stick the footnote in again and say, refer back to the first footnote. Joe Wilson, thank you, Joe. We'll have some questions. I know what the first thank question you. is gonna be. It happened in Fallon, Nevada. We'll come to you. It happened in Fallon, Nevada. I'm standing in line to get wiser 12 ounces at a time. That's two, Waddy Mitchell. I got two rhymes today. And this guy in front of me turns around and he says, Mister, I heard you talking about the wild horse. Well, they're just one generation from being a jackalope, jackalope and hopping off into the sagebrush. I said, would you say that on the radio? He said, I'd say anything on the radio. You're about to find out what I'm talking about. Because 13 years later, this guy has been on my Roll Route radio show every week but two. The significance of that? He had three serious life-threatening surgeries that about took his life, and the most memorable moment for us, Lucas, on my Roll Route radio show in 14 years is Hank Vogler in the hospital for being treated for pancreatic cancer, the young nurse coming in telling him what he's got to do, and he said, Honey, I'm not doing anything till I get done with this radio show. Hank Vogler. Hank couldn't be here today. I'm his evil twin, Honk. <laughs> I feel like Forrest Gump. I really do. But first of all, I'd like to thank all these rare and endangered species that are sitting in this audience. 98% of the people who signed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights 
were involved in agriculture. Now less than 1% actually make their living off of the land. That's a great tribute to having the right to own property. And as we have watched that drift away, that will be the demise of our republic. Remember, our founding fathers called democracy <clears throat> mob rule. This is a republic. Our representatives are supposed to represent us. Unfortunately, my Forrest Gump, I must confess to all of you, uh, I went to college with Howard and Frank Arcularius. They sold their ranch to the Hages. I've cut stud horses for the Hages. I've branded calves for them, and I've known them since I've been there. I ran into this gentleman in Denial, Nevada, and went back into Oregon to show him my version of what I grew up with. I grew up next to the wildlife refuge. My grandfather had some substantial holdings on the north end of that lake. Uh, we played everything north of town were loggers. Everybody south of town were pretty much cowboys, so when we were kids we paid cowboys and loggers. Uh, the saloons always had trouble with the cowboys and the loggers having disagreements. I was there when Denzel Ferguson got his start. He is the fellow that wrote the sacred cow at the public trough. He originally was hired to be the caretaker of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge field station. That field station once was the Job Corps. When I was in high school, I dug the holes that they poured the cement in, and you'd never guess who helped me, a fellow by the name of George Foreman. Yeah, boxer now, I guess, or retired. He's old as I am. He was a little cranky in those days, and he whipped everybody in Burns. His boxing coach was from Burns, Homer Ritchie. He left and went to another one in Roseburg, and then he was going to quit boxing. Homer went over there and stayed with him and mentored him until he became the world champion more than once. And even Muhammad Ali said he had never been hit harder by anybody in his life than George Foreman. You ever hear Andy Kerr? His <coughs> uncle Keith and his father Vernon used to elk hunt with me back in the days when they logged in eastern Oregon before the spotted owl came along. And we'd drive by a big old deck of logs, and everybody would say in unison, Oh, Andy ain't going to like that, Vernon. Just didn't like them decks of logs. So, I mean, it, it, it's kind of scary how small this world really is. Uh, I knew Waddy Mitchell when his name was Bruce. I've, I've known a lot of people in this room. I've known a lot of people in our movement. The Hammonds, they're in jail because of me. I was the one over half a case of beer and our kids fishing in a creek, leaning back on a rock and saying, you know, I bet you if you angled a ditch right over there, you could put that water in dry crumble. <laughs> and Dwight said, well, how can you do that? That's the government's water. And I said, well, they're under the same water rights we are. That water doesn't run interstate. It runs into Harney County. Put it in there, see what happens. They went all the way through the court system, and Dwight Hammond won. And when he won, he got a target on his back. When they came back and fenced up the Big Bird water hole, it's the only water hole that they fenced up, but it was the one that was a detriment to the Hammond family. Uh, I ran the surveying instrument when we dug the ditch. So it's my fault. Denzel Ferguson started messing with the young girls at the environmental field station. They used to come over to my grandfather's ranch, and they wanted me to give him the uh, entrance to the back gate of Wright's Point, and I wouldn't let him do it. I made him walk up the side of the hill, said it was a much better view of the valley. Well, then the kids started asking him, how come all the wildlife was up here on private land? Why, why weren't they down on this refuge that they had miraculously changed from 61 different people, being able to use that refuge at certain times of the year and then they re-irrigated all of that country over and over and made young, fresh grass for all the wildlife. He quit coming after a while, and then, of course, the community ostracized him. The first time I saw him, he was at my uh, brother-in-law's branding, Buck Taylor, and uh, he had a West Texas accent, a cowboy hat on, and kind of had one shoulder dropped like he'd just been pulled off a bull, you know, by a gully. Yes, sir. And then he got to beating his wife, broke her arm, and... Uh, Suddenly he wrote the sacred cow at the public trough. So I guess that's 
some of the reasons we have environmentalism. The guy that started Earth Day, by the way, they found his wife in a trunk. So, you know, uh, there's a little hypocrisy out there on their side, too. And we have a lot of hypocrisy in Washington, D.C. And that hypocrisy would be that there's too much money. Environmental groups have got too much. The anti-groups have got too much. So they whack up the money, fight all day long, sleep together at night. And then they get the gold and they put it in uh, Panama, I guess is now where Hillary puts her money now in Panama, isn't it? I, you know, it's just, it, it, it's a joke. We have to take our country back. But I also remember very well Robert Beetle Bailey addressing the Oregon Cattle Association about what was going to happen to the Wild Horse Act. And I wish I had a copy of that speech because he never missed a lick. He told everybody exactly what was going to happen. I saw the spotted owl ruin Oregon's logging industry. Now they're crossing with the barred owl, and the crossbreds have got dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot on their chest because they're going to kill all of them because they've crossed the breed. One of the things that affects me the most in the state of Nevada are predators. I grew up when the sage hens got up and blackened the sky. There were a million head of sheep in the state of Nevada. There was also predator control. From 1492 till 1971, predators were down, 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 down. So if you were writing in the early, late 60s, early 70s on predation by coyotes or any other predators, they were at the lowest ebb since 1492. So you did find a, a coyote that survived the bait stations by wandering around, eating rabbits, grasshoppers, ground squirrels, and staying the heck away from the bait stations. We didn't kill them all, obviously. So then when they took away this very effective poison that was odorless, colorless, and tasteless, that was originally designed in the Second World War, war to kill people, uh, it takes 10 times the concentration of 1080 to kill a rat. They can still use it to kill rats in the United States. We compete against New Zealand, who buys 300 tons of it a year for their island to kill several species, from rabbits to opossums to other introduced species. And it's made in the United States, and we cannot use it. But if you were out writing the new Bible for the environmental movement, there was very little predation on anything except grasshoppers, ground squirrels, and those kinds of things. If you saw a lion track, you could call the trapper, and they would come and hunt that lion down. All predators are at their lowest ebb, and so all prey was at a, as a, at a zenith, along with cattle and sheep. Now they've taken all the cows away. They've taken all the sheep away. Nevada had a million head of sheep. Now they have 70,000. And those 70,000 sheep, 90% of them are controlled by 12 people. So the tables have kind of turned, but the, the, the theme hasn't. Everything is based on false data. The data they had when they wrote the book for the college, for the classes that the people that are in the, in the wildlife department all learned about all the evils of this, the evils of that, and how predators were of no problem. Well, they are now. Uh, the Gardner family and many other ranching families of uh, <clears throat> supported part of their ranch by taking people hunting. The Game Commission in Nevada has driven a wedge between these people and made us evil victims to where we get our livestock shot and all these kinds of things. Me as a sheep guy, we have heck with the fact that the wild sheep and the domestic sheep share a pneumonia. The pneumonia has to do with stress in cattle. It's called shipping fever. Everybody should be aware of this because they're running out of sheep to blame it on. It's going to be cows next. They've already blamed it on some cows in Colorado. Some wild sheep came down and wintered with some bulls. Very severe winter, and they got stressed and died of pneumonia. Well, they had, you know, without doing some risk assessment, the risk of this happening is somewhere up there with getting hit by space junk or a meteorite to kill one of these wild sheep. It's so minuscule it means nothing. But in order to get the grand slam of sheep, from the United States of America, the hardest one to get is the desert bighorn. As a resident of Nevada, I was lucky enough to get one. If you buy one on the open market, I think the governor's tag went for $350,000 last year. 
You can go to Mexico and hunt them for about $150,000. So there are a lot of people that are pretty well healed trying to get those four species of wild sheep. So when the so-called protectors of the wildlife, which by the way, they're vested in the state of Nevada. They should be the property of the state of Nevada. I don't know where the rest of these guys get in on it, but they do in the BLM and the Forest Service. They all have these biologists and they all have confabs, you know. They all learn something from the spotted owl. You never hear about spotted owl anymore, but we're going to hear about the sage grouse for another hundred years just because now they're vested and they know how to keep this a growing problem. Now they're fighting fires in Nevada like they're uh, in downtown Los Angeles. So all of this stuff. But when you have that much power with money, follow, always follow the money. And the money is, is if you want to get the grand slam, the hardest one to get is the one in Nevada. It's, it, you have to draw a ticket unless you can afford the governor's tag. So they've got a bunch of well-heeled people. All they got to do is get on the horn and say, hey, if we can get rid of this sheep guy, there's going to be, you know, an elk, a deer, a antelope, a bighorn sheep under every tree. And they send them a bucket load of money. So just follow the money and it'll kind of tell you where everything thing is at. But anyhow, back to Burns, Oregon for a moment and then I'll quit. I was in Shendu, China, a thousand miles south of Beijing when the incident in Oregon, when the BLM's new acronym became Back Shooting Lion Murderers, uh, they jumped those people in that Idlewild Canyon where there's no cell signal. So they, it, it was well staged. It was well staged. Seventy percent of the money that rolls through Burns, Oregon now is not private money. Agriculture's been pretty well decimated. Logging's gone. Seventy percent of the checks in that town. The money. That sheriff did what the what his constituency wanted. They're all federal. All the little towns now have been replaced by these federal people. I'm on a special group that is trying to help the Hammondses. We met Tuesday. They've had to sell part of their cattle. The BLM will not uh, give their permit back to them. They're dragging them around by the nose. They, they already got their pound of flesh. They want more. They want to destroy these people. We're talking about Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, Ward and June Cleaver. Susie was the woman of the year. Dwight was cattleman of the year. And Stephen was young farmer of the year. Kind of an irony, don't you think? So maybe I did get off subject a little bit here. And I, I hate to even come to these meetings. I can't read Range Magazine because it's so close to my heart. I probably won't sleep for the next three or four days. But anyhow, thank you for allowing me to vent a little bit. Predators, uh, right now we're lambing. We're having one of the best lamb crops we've ever had. If this is global warming, God bless it. We've never had more feed in eastern Nevada in my career, 32 years. So bring it on. Bring it on. I, I think it's great. So anyhow, if there's any questions, I guess I, if I, somebody's got a light on me, a couple of them, I can't see worth the darn bit. Sit down. I'll take care of the questions. Pardon? I'll take care of the questions. Sit okay. down. Okay. Hank Bogler. So we got a couple of fellers here from uh, San Joaquin Valley in California that, do you know anything about predators? <laughs> often with badges. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask a question of the Attorney Joseph. Um, you can answer, please. We've heard a lot about WOTUS and what its impacts on property rights and farming and grazing are going to be, but there's also been a whole effort on expanding the definitions and lowering the standards for what is critical habitat designation under the Endangered Species Act, but I haven't had a real material description of what is that. Do you know? Uh, I do know, I can say this, that uh, regs literally just came out within the past few weeks uh, addressing critical habitat designations. Uh, and we do think, and it's our opinion, again, our opinion, and hopefully this answers your question, that the definition and the application by the listing agencies of the critical habitat definition, they're reading key terms out of it, like there's critical habitat, prudent is a key term, the critical habitat definition. 
Prudent can mean a lot of things in terms of, hey, is it good for people? They're, they're going away with that. Um, they're also using the critical habitat designation to deal with a lot of, well, this species might move in the future, in part because of global warming, to a new range, so we're going to designate that as critical habitat. The, the listing agencies have come up with the thought that they can do that, and again, we'd submit that that has uh, departed from A, what the ESA allows, and B, even the terms of their own regs. I hope that addressed your question. Yeah, those are definitely the issues I'm very concerned about. I so. wonder if it's a coincidence all my lambing range is now critical habitat for the sage grouse, even though we've had a 22 and a 15% increase in the two valleys that I use. But we control ravens. They come in on private land. When they come in on the private land, we call up the animal damage control, tell them, hey, I went out and fed this morning. Uh, ravens come in, killed two saddle horses and a bull. And they bring out eggs and uh, ask no questions. So it's up to everybody that's a landowner. If you have a concentrations of ravens, show up on your property. Call wildlife services. Have them taken out. And keep taking them out until they're down to a number. We have a 1,000% increase in the state of Nevada of ravens. And 80% of the nest disturbances by ravens. And the answer is remove livestock. Can you spell hypocrisy? Well, I've seen in the Sacramento River with the smelt. Hey, Trent, can I say one thing? Coming back yes. to your question, and this actually may help you out. My colleague is hosting a, a teleconference or webinar, literally, on this topic, on the new critical habitat definition next week. And if you want, talk to me afterwards, or if anyone's interested, you're more than welcome. We, we actually would love to have you all. We learn as attorneys as much from the people who are affected as much as we try to deal with you so let me know and i'll get you the, the dial and stuff to finish that thought and hank I'm, this is for you but, but in the sacramento river i've learned that by spending the money that they have which is like 12 million dollars last i knew to improve the habitat for this delta smelt all they did was improve the habitat for the predators which made it tougher for the delta smelt to survive and that's basically what you just said about the ravens true or false that's use the microphone Basically, it's true. Uh, now you're making me more feel like Forrest Gump. Back in the 30s, my grandfather, uh, who traded a horse for my grandmother, was working on a project to take water from Northern California to Southern California because they had a history of drought. That's what that whole system was built on, was because of drought. And he wrote her a letter. And, and I, I, I don't know who in my family wound up with it. I asked a thousand times. The letter read like this, Pearl. That was my grandmother's name. He didn't say, hey, baby, I miss you. It was, Roosevelt is a Bolshevik, but he's on a wet ticket. They're going to repeal prohibition. We'll be able to sell liquor by the drink. I've run into this outfit that's bought Holt, Cat uh, Holt Tractor Company. They're going to call it Caterpillar. I showed him how to, he was a machinist. I showed him how to fix the rollers on the carriers. They offered me either a patent or a franchise. I'm going to take a, I mean, he had, he laid out his life. I am going to take a franchise. You go see Mrs. Odom, rent the pool hall. There's four track crews that turn around in Canal, Washington. We can sell liquor by the drink. I can repair, uh, get your drunken brothers in here and get them working over there in the Franklin Hotel. We'll get that. I mean, he just laid out their life, and they were probably two of the most successful people in the, when they passed away of anybody on this earth and, and did it all because Roosevelt was a Bolshevik, but he was going to have liquor by the drink, and he was in California heading the water south in a government project. So, yeah, it is a real small world. By the way, they think they were, you were kidding about your grandfather and your grandmother. No, no, that was a, when they get mad at each other. Uh, and I'd had to listen to the argument. Well, he, 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 she'd say, uh, you tight old bastard. <clears throat> and he'd go take his paper and get, pull his paper down. and go, now, Pearl, that was a damn good horse I traded for you. I'll hold it, Brian. 
Joe, is it <coughs> conceivable that uh, a President Trump could have the wall forbidden to be built by the snail darter under the Endangered Species Act? So, Brian, let me answer that question. I can't, I can't deal with the, the snail darter itself. I, I'll be honest. I like to answer questions with stuff that I actually know about. But I do know when the, uh, right there was a parallel wall that was built a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, they had to get legislation to make a, a special exception under the Endangered Species Act for that. So I think that that's going to educate where we're going, that a snail darter could stop a government process. But he'd probably rely on a national defense exception to the Endangered Species Act. That's the difference between you and Hank. Hank is not, uh, he's not worried about knowing anything about the subject in order to answer the question. <laughs> Next question. Anybody? Oh, Aaron Moppin. Excuse me, Lois Lane. Hi. Um, I'd like to thank Cliff and Herb for spending your whole life fighting so that my kids can continue on in, in agriculture. But I have a question for you both. Um, seeing how that you've been in this fight for a long time, do you have any new ideas on how we can get the people to pull their head out of the sand and stand together, ranchers and farmers. Can I amend that, Aaron? Ranchers, farmers, the miners that we saw here, the loggers, every resource entity working together, Cliff, how do we do that? Well, apathy is a big problem, of course, in the United States. And apathy was also the problem that many great civilizations faced historically in the world. But I think, this is my opinion, a great pride of, part of our problem is our leadership and our lack of education. We started, myself and others, I don't know, it was early 1990s, I guess, and the first meetings, like DeMar alluded to earlier today, there were 800 people show up, and since that time, they've diminished and diminished and diminished. Now, the other day, I had a meeting in Elko, Nevada. I think there was 20 people showed up. Well, everybody's apathy, apathetic. But I look at the Cattlemen's Association. I can remember coming out of high school in the 1950s, and the Cattlemen's Association meeting in there in Elko, they could get eight, 900 people to go down to the legislature. And now just the leaders get involved. And the leaders are all uh, conducting themselves to appease the government. And so all the little ranchers, when I first really got started heavily, 1984, when they put the first resource management plan across for central Nevada, it puts all the small ranchers out of business within a few short years. Well, those people set an example in a way that was going to happen to the rest of them. So the rest of the people left in the livestock industry more and more, instead of standing up for their industry, for their neighbors, for what America's been all about, they learn to appease. And we've become a culture of appeasement. So I blame the people. I blame the leaders in Farmville, in the cattlemen, and someone in the sheep industry, and even myself. But it's still we start finding ways, so I'm not offering a solution, but I think the solution is on the local level. Think about it, every problem the progression has been every problem that we face as Americans, we go to our legislators to solve the problem. And what are we doing? We're strengthening the federal government, when that was never the intent of the founders of this nation. The founders of this nation intended that problems be solved on a local level. And right now, when I go among the people and I try to convey a better understanding of what I think of what the founders tried to put across, I am finding very, a very difficult time. So I think we need to look into ourselves, and I think the ultimate answer is government at the local level. And Cliff, I think that's why we're here, is to empower the next age leaders, like Kathy Smith, who's Very about good. to ask a question. Thank you. I feel like I'm in a room full of uh, heroes and celebrities, but especially Hank. It's so fun to meet you, Hank Vogler. I brought copies of Range Magazine that I want all of you to take two or three 
and help out C.J. Hadley, who does such a great job with range. She's losing some advertisers because they don't like what she's writing about what happened in Oregon. So we got to step up and support her. So take those and get some, subs some subscriptions out there to your friends. Thanks, Hank. Thank you. I, uh, it was quite a shock to be 1,000 miles south of Beijing in China and on the local news was my hometown of Burns, Oregon and pictures that I could see Wright's Point, which has always been the monument. But to you, Ms. Maubin, let me say this. This guy right here is Trent Luce. It used to be a joke on his TV, on his radio show because it was mostly back in the, in the ranchers and stuff in the Midwest. The joke was you could win a case of beer if you picked the closest time to during the conversation on Monday when Hank Vogler said sage grouse. It mostly, immediately right? got not nearly as funny when the lesser prairie chicken showed up. That was a bad day at Big Rock. And you have the governor of Kansas saying, anybody here comes and tries to enforce that, I'll throw him out, of, I'll drive him to the border personally, and if he comes back, I'll throw him in jail. All of a sudden, we had a slug of converts that came and went, whoa, how could, they? you know, we are the incubator. We out here in the West that have to deal with the federal bureaucracies every day. We are the incubator for the whole mess. What they can shove down our throat, they think they can eventually shove down other people's throat, but it's private land. It's the value of that private land in the Midwest. And now that, just like cancer, I know all about cancer. I had last rites four times. In fact, if I start to die today, uh, I don't have to call a priest. Uh, I can give them to myself. I know, I know what to say. Tim. But anyhow, you've got people that are now being affected coast to coast where there's a snail darter. At one time, more people in the South had malaria than had electricity. We're starting, cancer's growing, and that cancer is government has to spend all the money in the budget and then ask for twice as much the next year, get cut back to half, and then call it baseline budgeting. That's the key, is eventually it will empower everybody because everybody will be affected. That's huh? what I think is going to happen. Jump in here, Tim. We're about to get him wound up. Um, I, I'd like to say one thing that, that reflects back on a couple of things that were said about local. The, the, the answer has to come to local. I think if you look back and see what happened in our county, uh, we had the ability in Harney County to handle the issue that came up in front of us. And if we had a society that the paradigm wasn't to look to big government for your answer, the, par the paradigm should be to look within, within our county for those solutions. If we would have done that, that problem would have gone away. We would not have had that problem. So that's, I, I believe very firmly that the answer is going to come from local, but we can't get local until we have jurisdictional changes, and that's why we're, that's why I'm here today, for those jurisdictional changes. The second thing I want to say is that every time, and I've said this, I, I was a, in the, on the Watershed Council for 12 years, I ran it for nine years, it started being taken over by government agencies, and we gave away more dollars out of that Watershed Council that went to no good. What Every time you buy into a grant, federal grant program, you validate that federal agency. And when you, when, you, when you refuse to do it and do it on your own, you're looking within yourself, and that's the beginning of the empowerment of the individual and the small community is look within yourself. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. Thank you, guys. Cliff, you wanted to weigh in on that quick, didn't you? Quick. Yes, I'd like to suggest that we are living in a very critical time, not only because of the stage of socialism as it come forward, but also, I thought again and again, we have a great opportunity because with sage grouse, we have a tremendous amount of data out there to which we can use to discredit the agencies. Plus, earlier today, you saw all the information come forward with regards to the management of wild horses. If we start fighting about concerns of bugs and butterflies, we can never whip them. But we have historical accounts of what has actually took place before settlement, what our American system government did for this great country. And we need to use that. And I would suggest to all of you that we need to pull together now and use that data 
and we need to go on the offensive and we need to discredit this whole system of socialism and what it's doing the agencies all the again and again I go to meetings and livestock people are always on the defensive always on the defensive when they should have the moral high ground they should be protecting our system of government but they aren't the data is there let's take advantage of it let's go out and win this fight thank you cliff joe hank